Hey, good morning, Christ Point. How are we doing this morning? Man, that was terrible. Y'all are tired. Well, I'm super glad you're here this morning. We're so glad that you made it to the barn this morning. Um, I wanted to share a verse that was super uh, encouraging to me this week. It comes from Colossians chapter 1, um, verses 13, starting. It says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. It is a glorious day this morning because of the finished work he did on the cross, that he pulled us out of our mess um, and into his family. You are a loved, uh, chosen member of his family this morning. Let's stand and let's sing about that. I was buried beneath my sin. could carry that kind of weight. It was my tomb till I met you. And I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried It was my turn till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave.
Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, redemption's hell, for your blood was spilled. Everything I want and dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. goodness. 
Would you pray with me? Father, how good you are to us. Your word states how you love us, and I am so grateful for that. Your word tells us that we are precious to you, and I'm so grateful for that. And so I pray this morning, Father, as we come to hear your word, as we come to hear it um, expounded upon, I just pray that you would let us know, each one of us as we're here this morning, that you would let us know how precious you are, how precious we are to you, and how you love us and care for us. Thank you for these songs this morning that remind us that you came, that you gave your life for us so that we might know you and we might be with you in the coming days. We're so grateful for that, Father. So grateful for this time together as we worship and as we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I get the distinct honor of reading the word with you this morning. It should be up on the screen. If not, it's John chapter 18, verse 15. John chapter 18, verse 15. This this passage strikes home because I would be just like Peter. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. And since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. 
So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. And Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues in the the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And while he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Ananias then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. So the kids are excused. I remember. The kids are excused. Thank you, Chris. Yes, you did. I always love watching the kids run back and uh, just thinking about the impact that our volunteers are going to have uh, in their hearts and in their lives, uh, not just today, but hopefully for, uh, for years to come. I always uh, try to remember to, to pray for them as I see them, uh, see them running back, and uh, not just for the kids, but also for the teachers, <laughs> particularly if I go long. Uh, so I'll be praying for them uh, this morning. On November 12th, uh, 2012, I stopped by the hospital to pray for my friend John, who was preparing for surgery. I couldn't help but notice a uh, rather a large yellow bracelet on his wrist. In bold uppercase letters, it simply read, fall risk. I remember telling John, I think we should all have one of those. Uh, we are all a prone to a fall. Fall is a nice way of saying what the Bible describes as uh, sin. We give in to sin or temptation. We are walking with the Lord until uh, we're not. Uh, All of us are prone to a fall. At our very worst, we all have it within ourselves to mess things up. Of course, nobody sets out to be tripped up. Uh, Nobody sets out to fall. Uh, but all too often, we do. And so this morning, I want us to consider the anatomy of a fall by looking at the life of the Apostle Peter as told in John chapter 18. My prayer is that we will leave this morning with an appropriate fear, a godly humility, hope. Uh, The first thing that we notice about the anatomy of a fall is that oftentimes it begins with an unspeakably beautiful encounter with the living God. The anatomy of a fall usually begins with an unspeakably beautiful encounter with the living God. I mean, think about it. Typically, there are encounters that God's people have with the living God that oftentimes result in a significant commitment uh, to God. Oftentimes, this encounter is actually a good and a beautiful thing. It is a moment in time when God, through and by His Spirit, works in our hearts and in our lives in such a way that our lives are changed uh, forever. Uh, Peter had many of those experiences with Christ. Peter walked with Christ. He followed Christ. He experienced the miracles of Christ. He seemingly loved Christ and devoted his life uh, to following Christ. He saw uh, the glory of Christ. Christ. And so when I uh, share with you that oftentimes a fall begins 
with an unspeakably beautiful encounter with God. I can't help but think of some of the encounters that Jesus had with Christ. And at least one that oftentimes comes to mind was when Peter, James, and John experienced the transfiguration. Uh, Believe it or not, the transfiguration is not recorded for us in John's gospel. It's the only gospel that that story is not included. And so I think of uh, the story as told uh, in Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Scripture reads, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Let's just stop there for a second. Peter, James, and John go up to the mountain, and Jesus is transfigured before their very eyes. Scripture says his face is like the sun, his clothes become white as light. Jesus literally lights up the place. Recently, Melissa went out of town for a week. And I wanted to do some work around the house while she was gone. I wanted to complete significant projects. And so one day, I drove to Lowe's to buy a light bulb for the garage. That was my significant project. But wait, before you laugh, it was not just any light bulb. It was a high-powered light bulb. You see, our garage has been lit like a dimly lit subway tunnel since we moved in. I don't even know why they had a light bulb in there. Oftentimes, I found myself daydreaming of what it would be like to call an electrician to come over and put bright lights into the garage. Apparently, I didn't need an electrician. I just needed a light bulb. One day, I installed the light bulb into the garage. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't just change the light bulb. I installed it. Because installed sounds more involved and manly than simply I changed the light bulb. I mean, small children can change a light bulb. Not this guy. This guy installed the light bulb. The results were spectacular. So good. I'm not joking. Melissa was still away. Every once in a while, I just would open the door into the garage, and I would turn the light on. And I'd stand back, and I'd put my hands on my hips, and I'd be like, that's right. That's right. She's going to like this when she comes home. I was so proud of myself. The only problem was... That stinking light bulb was so bright. Like you could literally not look at it. My my son came home from college and he took one look at it and he's like, Dad, my eyes hurt because it was so bright. When I read this story of what happened with Jesus and Peter, James, and John, it says that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. I mean, I can only imagine the brightness of, of Christ. He was like the sun. Moses and Elijah and Jesus are up on the mountain. They are revealing themselves to Peter, uh, James, and John. And Peter comes up with this great idea to pitch some tents. Like, hey guys, this is good. Let's stay here for a while and hang out. I read about that experience, and I think to myself, in Peter's back pocket, he has that experience. Like, that happened to him. I have to imagine that that changed him in some way, shape, or form. 
Now, something tells me, if you are a follower of Jesus, that some point in your life you have had an experience with God. Admittedly, admittedly, it was probably not on a mountaintop uh, with James or with, with Jesus and Moses and Elijah, but it was a significant moment nonetheless. I mean, God did a work in your heart and in your life, maybe when you least expected it. Maybe it was a summer camp experience as a middle school or a high school student. Maybe it was a conference that you attended, some friend dragged you along. Maybe it was a concert that someone had an extra ticket to and they invited you. Maybe it was a time of prayer when you were alone and quiet. Maybe it was a conversation with a friend. Maybe it was that one message that you heard at church one morning. Oftentimes, those experiences in life are powerfully used by God. Those experiences motivate us and they move us. God does a work in us and we think to ourselves, I will never be the same. We are so so full of spiritual vigor and excitement. We are committed to, to daily follow Jesus, no matter what. Peter was so moved by his experiences with Christ that he wanted, one, to set up camp and stay a while, uh, but two, we also see in his a life that he was so moved uh, by Christ that he made bold proclamations, declarations, overly zealous commitments uh, to God. I'm reminded of his words, Peter's words in John chapter 13, when Jesus is speaking to Christ, it says in verse 36, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Right? So, and Peter is just full of courage. Peter had walked with Christ, he had experienced the goodness of Christ, the miracles of Christ, the love of Christ, the transfiguration of Christ, and as you can imagine, Peter is bought in, and so he makes this bold declaration, like, God, no matter what, Jesus, I'll lay down my life for you. You can count on me. Just point me in the right direction. I'll do anything for you. You ever have a moment like that? God has, has stirred your heart. You've had an experience with God. You, you make a bold claim for God. Those are good things, right, by the way? Like when you have an experience with the Lord and He does something in you, praise the Lord for that. The times when God stirs in your heart and causes you to go, man, I'm in. I'm in, Jesus. You can count on me. Here I am. Send me. I'll give my life for you. That was Peter. Bold commitment uh, to the Lord. And yet one of the things that we notice in Peter's life, and one of the things that if we were honest, we notice in our life, is that oftentimes we are easily inspired, but we are not easily changed. We're easily inspired, but we're not easily changed. Verse 38 reads, Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Oh, the commitment's the easy part, isn't it? I mean, signing your name on the dotted line, going, hey, I'm in. That's the easy part. The hard part is the follow-through. The hard part is the life change. I mean, how many times in life have you thought to yourself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start budgeting. I'm going to live on a budget. Ooh, sale. <laughs> that didn't last long. Man, I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to do things a little differently. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat well this year. Ooh, crumble cookies. Like, have you tasted those things? I know they're $12 a cookie, but by golly, are they good. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And then you hop on Instagram, and all of a sudden you're watching a video with a little kid or a cat. And you're going, what happened? 
you, you devote yourself to being in the Word. Because I'm going to be different. I've got, a, I've got a plan. And you start reading names that you can't pronounce, and you're like, I'm out. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm going to serve. I mean, when the time's right. And the time's not right. <laughs> not now. Not now. I'm going to go on a mission trip. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on a mission trip. Someday. Someday I'm going to go. We are easily inspired, but we are not easily changed. Peter was easily inspired. When he, when he spoke these words to Jesus, when he committed to lay down his life for Christ, I, I have no doubt that he didn't mean it. And yet time is, is the great revealer of uh, the human heart or our fickle heart. If you want to know the anatomy of a fall, it usually begins with a beautiful experience with God, a good, a good and beautiful experience. Oftentimes, it's met with an overly zealous commitment to God, a, a commitment to do better, to be better, to really hunker down, to be focused, to be disciplined, to be committed. But then oftentimes, it moves from that beautiful experience with God, that overly zealous commitment to God, to simply denying God. John chapter 18, our text this morning Peter is going to, unfortunately, live out uh, the words that Jesus spoke to him. John chapter 18, verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Right, at this point in the story, Jesus had been arrested and taken to Annas. Caiaphas was the high priest that year and the son-in-law of Annas. If the Jewish leaders wanted to have Jesus judged and condemned, they would have to go through Pontius Pilate, the Roman gover governor. And the stepping stone to Pilate uh, in the legal system was Caiaphas and not Annas. However, in the eyes of the Jews, Annas was the high priest. The Romans had deposed Annas as the high priest, but in Israel, the high priest was appointed for life and could not be disposed. So those pious, orthodox Jews took Jesus to Annas first because they saw him as the true high priest, despite what the Romans said. The disciple who was with Peter, who was not named, many people believe that it was John. Uh, there are times in John's gospel when John refers refers to himself but doesn't name himself. He might say something like the disciple who Jesus loved when describing himself. It was believed that John was a member of a priestly group within the Sanhedrin, so it makes sense that John would have been with Peter. So the disciples are following Jesus. The disciple who's unnamed goes into the court of the high priest, likely John, Peter, we're told, stood outside the door. So you can see the picture in your mind's eye. One disciple is inside in the court. Peter is outside. Verse 16 reads, But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Uh, if you're keeping track at home, that is strike one. We don't know why the servant girl asked Peter the question that she did. Maybe she thought she saw Peter with Jesus at some point. The text uh, doesn't tell us. 
She just simply asked him, you also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? And Peter answered, I am not. It's important to note that Peter is not on trial here. Uh, He doesn't have television cameras in his face. Uh, He hasn't been backed down by a first century biker gang. Uh, He doesn't find himself in the interrogation room with bright lights. There's no slow drop of water that is falling on his forehead. As best we know, he's not hooked up to any electricity. No one is grabbing him by the scruff uh, of the neck, dunking his head in a pool of water and bringing him up right before he takes his last breath. He is standing outside the courtyard and a servant girl asks him, are you also not one of this man's disciples? And Peter folds like an accordion. It's at this point in the story uh, that, uh, that John, the author, switches gears and changes scenes. We flash to Jesus being questioned by the high priest. John chapter 18, verse 19 reads, The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me uh, what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So again, John interrupts the story of Peter uh, by flashing to uh, this interaction uh, that Jesus has. Jesus is being uh, questioned. Verse 18, now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold They were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So, I mean, when you look at the scene, Peter sees the fire, goes over, warms himself at the fire. Uh, He's with others. Jesus is being questioned. Jesus is trying to be anonymous. He's hiding in uh, the shadows, but he doesn't want to run outside the court altogether. Eventually, in the cold, he went to the fire where other people, servants, and soldiers uh, found themselves standing to get warm in front of the flames. When the trial commenced, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. One author notes that while we don't know for sure how these sorts of trials were conducted, there is Jewish testimony that the prisoner who was on trial was never required to testify or answer questions. Instead, witnesses were called to speak at the trial. Witnesses against the accused and witnesses on behalf of the accused. The procedure would go like this. First, the witnesses on behalf of the accused were called to testify to the integrity of the one who was on trial. Then, the witnesses against the accused spoke. But all these procedures seem to have been thrown out the window as Annas proceeded to interrogate Jesus, asking him about his disciples and his doctrine. It is interesting that when Jesus uh, was delivered into the hands of Pilate, the charge against him was political, not theological. The Jews said, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. But at this stage, the Jewish leadership asked Jesus about his theology. If you're going to question anyone over their theology, I might recommend not starting with Jesus. Jesus told the high priest, listen, I am not hiding anything. I have taught Open, openly, there is nothing that has been hidden. Ask anyone who has heard me. They will tell you. It is at that point that Jesus is struck 
by the officer. Jesus responds. Jesus answered him. If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Verse 24 reads, Annas then bound him to Caiaphas, the high priest. And so after this interaction uh, between uh, Jesus and the officials, the scene now shifts back to Peter. Remember when we had left Peter, Peter was warming himself uh, by the fire. He had already denied uh, Jesus once uh, to uh, the young girl. And then verse 25 reads, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not one of the servants of the high priest. A relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Uh, If you are keeping track, uh, that is strike two and strike three. Peter is warming himself by the fire. He is outside in the courtyard of the high priest. The trial has been moved from Annas to Caiaphas. It's here that he's questioned again. You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denies it again and said, I am not. If you read uh, the account of Peter's denial in Matthew, it brings to light how strong Peter was in his denial. Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 74, uh, we're, we're told of Peter's response, and you'll notice that his response is heightened from the first time when he denied Jesus. Verse 69 reads, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. Verse 70, But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 72, and again he denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Verse 75 reads, And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. After the servant girl's question and Peter's answer, she she presses him. "Uh, You too were with Jesus the Galilean, verse 69 reads. Luke records Peter's agitated response to her accusation. Luke chapter twenty two fifty seven, 57, uh, Peter said to the girl, Woman, I do not know him. By referring to the servant girl as woman, Peter likely was trying to belittle her or minimize her credibility. It is also noteworthy that Peter denies knowing Jesus this time with an oath. By using an oath, Peter was attempting to bring greater weight to his claim that he did not know Jesus. There was no mention of Peter using any oath to deny Christ uh, the first time. But here, this suggests that Peter denied Jesus more emphatically or with more intensity the second time than he did the first time. Author and pastor Kent Hughes, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, makes an important observation of the Greek word that Matthew translated as no uh, within Peter's denial. We're going we're to word out or nerd out on a couple of Greek words, so bear with me. I know how much you love this. Uh, the word for no that is used in this passage is a Greek word, oida that describes a theoretical knowledge. Oida 
is different from another common Greek word for no, which is gnosko. Gnosko describes relational or experiential knowledge or familiarity. By denying that he did not know Jesus with the word oida, Peter is implying that he knows little or nothing about him. Had Peter said that he doesn't gnosko Jesus, you might look at that and say, well, Peter's trying to create a little distance. Sure, he knows of Jesus. Perhaps he's been around Jesus a time or two, but he doesn't know him uh, closely or intimately. But that's not the word uh, that Peter uses. Uh, Peter uses the word oida. I recently spoke with a young group of elementary students, and uh, for the sake of an illustration, I asked them to name someone famous. We went around the room, and everyone shared with me the name of someone famous, and I knew exactly zero of the names that were mentioned. I had no idea who they were talking about. On one hand, I felt incredibly old uh, because I hadn't a clue who they were talking about. But I told them, I said, I don't, I don't know who you're talking about. And I meant, I literally have no idea who you are talking about. I've never heard of that person before. That, in essence, is what Peter is saying about Jesus. Jesus? I don't... I don't, I don't even know him. I, I know nothing about that man. Peter's denial was as strong as it could be. It was stronger and harsher and more complete than if he simply said he did not gnosko Jesus. Peter is going out of his way to distance himself as far as he can from Jesus. Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Listen to the account of this same story from Matthew, chapter 26, verses 73 and 75 again. It says, After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Matthew writes that Peter's third denial took place a little later than the second. Luke is actually more precise with the story. Luke writes that the third denial happened about an, about, uh, after about an hour had passed. Uh, for reasons that are made clear later, Luke also seems to imply that Peter's third denial occurred after Jesus' second trial uh, had concluded. So we're, we're told here that Peter invokes a curse and he swears. Uh, to invoke a curse meant that you would call upon something or someone's ruin. Peter made the curse to demonstrate he was not with Jesus or a follower of Jesus. We're also told here that Peter swore. He swore that he did not know Jesus. It could mean that he used offensive language. People sometimes swear as a way to emphasize their earnestness or commitment to what they're saying. If Peter used derogatory language when he began to swear uh, that he did not know Jesus, that's a possibility. Or uh, to swear could mean uh, to call upon something when making a promise. Like when you were a kid and you would tell your friends, like, I swear on my mother's grave, I'm not lying. Like you're, as, like you're trying to go, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something even more significant or more severe to show you how serious I am. Either way, uh, Peter is serious.
serious about his denial of Christ. Peter wants to leave no doubt and leave no association whatsoever, whatsoever with Jesus. He wants to leave his relationship uh, with Jesus in the past, at least in this moment. And then, at that moment, at the moment when Peter is invoking a curse, when, when Peter is swearing, man, I blankety blank don't know the man. And he looks up and he sees Jesus and their eyes meet. Luke's account tells us Peter was swearing and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Oh, you, you can see it, can't you? You can, you can see the, the passion in the vigor of Peter's denial. You can see the moment when he looks up as he's swearing that he doesn't know the Lord. And he sees Christ in their eyes meet. And you can almost picture it, can't you? Like, have you been there before? Like you're, you're running hard and fast from the Lord. Like you want to get as far away as possible. You want to do life on your own terms. And it's as if when your hand is in the cookie jar, you look up into the eyes of your Savior. Jesus is being transferred from one trial uh, to the next. His prophecy to, to Peter came to mind, and Peter remembered the, the word which Jesus had said before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter's recollection of this word and sudden awareness of what he had said uh, gutted him. It gutted him. But the words were out. He had, he had spoken the words. He couldn't take them back. He couldn't bring them back. He couldn't have a mulligan or... A do-over, his denial uh, was done. He had failed. He had broken his promise three times. Uh, Peter played the part of coward. He denied that he had anything to do with Jesus in the strongest terms possible. Matthew and Luke describe Peter's response in identical terms. He wept bitterly. Their description reveals that Peter expressed bitter sorrow, deep regret, and terrible shame for what he had uh, just denied or for who he had just denied. Uh, Peter's fall, of course, is a, a great tragedy. As you think about his life with God, it began with an altogether good and beautiful spiritual experience that a short time uh, later was marked by uh, an overly zealous commitment to the Lord, then followed by an unexpected fall. But then again, uh, we're all fall risks, are we not? If you are here this morning and you think it can't happen uh, to you, it can happen to you. And it can happen to me. We never outgrow our ability uh, to make a mess of things. It doesn't matter how long we've been with the Lord. It doesn't matter how well we know Scripture. It doesn't matter how many passages we've memorized. It doesn't matter if that great experience with the Lord happened 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago. Uh, given the right situation, the right circumstances, the right time, all of us, all of us are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Are prone to leave the God I love. If you think it can't happen to you, it can happen to you. Knowing what we are truly capable of ought to humble us. It ought to humble all of us. None of us are above train wrecking our lives. 
That doesn't mean that we shouldn't get out of bed in the morning and live in constant fear. Uh, It doesn't mean that we can't fight sin and temptation by the power of the Spirit and experience God's sanctifying grace. It doesn't mean that we resign ourselves uh, to failure and just assume that we are going to drift toward destruction. Well, you know, we're all broken. We're all sinners. We all have our stuff. It doesn't mean that we should live that way or function that way. It does mean that we should be humble and vigilant. It, whatever it is, uh, can happen to you and it can happen to me. A third, and this is so important, remember uh, that the fall doesn't mean you're finished. The fall doesn't mean you are finished. The fall doesn't mean you are finished. What gives us hope is that this is not the end of the Apostle Peter's story. There would be another fire in his life post-resurrection. Jesus comes to Peter one day by a breakfast fire, not to reprimand him, but to restore him. Certainly, the ripple effect of any fall is significant. The decisions we make in life are not inconsequential, but it's oftentimes what happens after the fall that determines our trajectory with our life uh, with God. We feel guilt and we feel shame like Peter and perhaps we weep bitterly. But then what? Like where do we go uh, from there? How do we uh, pick up the pieces? Will we ultimately double down and continue to pursue sin? Will we continue to hide? Choosing a life of secrecy? Always going out of our way to put our best foot forward? Choosing the appearance of godliness instead of a life of godliness? Will we wallow in our guilt? Choosing to take ourselves out of the game instead of choosing to trust and the sanctifying power of the good news of the gospel? Or will we experience godly guilt, confess, and repent? Will we turn from our sin and trust that God might, just might, know better than we do? Peter's story did not end here, not in this moment. And yours does not either. God is not done uh, with you yet. Uh, Yes, it is true that all of us are a fall risk. But based on what happens next for Peter, it is a risk that God was and is willing to take. It was for Peter and it is for you. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your living and active word. We thank you for how you use it to convict us, uh, to confront us. We thank you that it is used to form us and shape us. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, the good news of the gospel that meets us in our brokenness and our sin and extends to us the grace and the mercy that we are so desperate for. Uh, God, thank you that uh, that sin does not have the final say in our hearts and in our lives because of Jesus. Lord, thank you that you use uh, sinful and broken people, you you redeem them, you make them new, Uh, you breathe life into them, you breathe life into us. And this morning we give you thanks. 
But God, if there are people here this morning who are running from you, I pray that you would draw them near by your spirit. And I pray that you, by the power of your spirit, would allow them to experience your purifying grace. God, we love you. We thank you so much for loving us first. We pray these things in Jesus' name and by your spirit. Amen. Would you stand with me?
have a seat. I'm grateful for the deep love of God. If you're here this morning and uh, God is working in your heart through and by your spirit, I want to let you know that uh, we'd be honored to be able to pray with you at the end of the service, myself or uh, one of the elders. Judy, I know, is here uh, and will be available up front. Uh, if you are new to Christ Point, I want to welcome you. It was a joy to be able to worship with you this morning. Uh, there are a couple ways that you can get connected here at Christ Point. You can fill out the connection card that is in the seat back in front of you. Uh, let us know that you were here this morning. Place it in the black offering box in the back of the church on your way out. Or you can scan that QR code. Uh, it'll take you to a website, fill out some basic information, and you can stay in touch with what's taking place here at Christ Point. Also, you can download uh, the Church Center app if you have not done so already. We keep that up to date. Honestly, that's one of the best and most effective ways uh, to know what's taking place here at Christ Point. If you're looking about, like, how do I take my next step here? To, how do I get plugged in? Uh, if you're interested in what's taking place this next month in April, uh, download the Church Center app and you can uh, follow along. I want to let our college students know that after the service today, uh, we have a lunch at the CP House for the college students. Uh, you are invited for a free lunch. Did I mention it's a free lunch? I would highly recommend that you take advantage of the free lunch. Uh, tomorrow is a big day for us here at CP. Uh, we have a meeting with a bank in Charlotte. Uh, if you've been with us for a little while, you know that a couple years ago we purchased six and a half acres of land right off Ridge Road, right over my right shoulder, uh, to your left, right there on the road. Uh, we have been praying that God would provide the funds and the resources uh, for us to move dirt and build. Uh, we believe that project will be about $2.6 million. Uh, we have in our savings account about $660,000. 330000 of that 660000 is earmarked for that project. Uh, as of now, we've been able to get about 1.8-ish uh, from banks. We want to be just a little over $2 million. That's kind of our prayer. And so we have a meeting downtown tomorrow. Pray that God would grant to us favor, uh, that we would find uh, the right bank uh, to lend us that money. Or, or I came up with this crazy idea, uh, pray that God would stir in someone's heart uh, deep generosity uh, to give us all we need uh, for the project. So listen, before you go, <laughs> good luck with that. I just am a firm believer that God can do it. And so, and, and we're open, uh, we're open uh, to both. But in order, I like to pray for all of it. And then if God sees fit for us to go the other route, then, then so be it. But please be praying along with us. Uh, this coming up Friday is Good Friday. It's an opportunity that we have to come and gather as a church to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We have a service here at the barn at 7 p.m. We invite you to come. We'll have communion together. It'll be a short devotional. We'll worship together and pray that God sets our hearts to celebrate on Easter Sunday. Our Easter service is going to be 1030 on Sunday morning. Uh, it's actually going to be outside. Um, I've been told that it's not going to be as cold next week as it was this week. Uh, bring a sweater just in case, but it's actually supposed to be a beautiful day. Come at 10 o'clock. There's donuts and coffee. You'll have an opportunity to connect with those who call Christ Point home. I uh, would encourage you to come ready to sit outside. We're going to do our best to have you not look into the blazing sun like we've done in years past. Uh, and so we just want to we want to prepare you uh, for that. Also want to encourage you, if you have not yet invited uh, friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, there should be some invite cards on the back table on your way out. Please take one of those and distribute those to uh, someone you know and care about and love. Uh, asking someone to come on Easter is oftentimes an, an easy ask. Sometimes people uh, are open to coming to a church service. So we would invite you um, to do that. Uh, Christ point, God, oh, wait, 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 no, 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 no. Nope, just kidding. <laughs> I forgot I forgot about April. Uh, lots of things in April. We have a church picnic the first Sunday, second Sunday before the service is Discover Christ Point. The third Friday in April is our volunteer appreciation uh, meal. It's on a Friday night. If you haven't yet signed up, would encourage you to do so. Read your Christ Point news. God bless. We'll see you on Friday. <laughs>